because it will is time already. Okay. Yep. Go over the homework. Go over the homework assignment. Okay, absolutely. So let's go ahead and do that first. Yeah, you got a mosquito. Yeah. Shoot it. Um, yeah, they, they like me a lot. So I'm getting prepared with my rubber band. <coughs> so I'm going to put it here. Probably will need it later. That's also, you know, I, I, I'm very tempted to bring along this thing. It's called a bug a salt. Bug a salt. Okay, you cannot see the words. Fine. <laughs> Bug A salt. <clears throat> and it is a It's a salt gun. So you load it up with table salt. You load it up with table salt for you know regular, you know, uh, mosquitoes and flies. But if you have yellow jackets, that will only irritate the yellow jackets. So with yellow jackets you have to use bigger grains of salt. I think sea salt doesn't work yet. What is the bigger grains of salt? Rock salt. Rock salt, that's it. Yeah, so you need to use rock salt you know, on, uh, on yellow jackets. Um, I find that it takes about seven shots to get um, black widows. But since black widows are relatively stationary, I'm not too concerned. They just kind of stand there and get shot. But yellow jackets is a different story. <coughs> One shot and they come after you. <laughs> but I, I hesitate to bring this on campus because they said, you know, no guns and whatnot. And, you know, the police, the campus police may look at this and go like, Tag, what have you got? It's a, it's a, it's a salt gun? No, no, no. We classify this as a shotgun, so we're going to take you into custody. Then you guys won't have a professor teacher classes anymore, right? So. <clears throat> so that's why I'm switching to a rubber band. Uh, I only have one today, but you know, when I was a kid, I would use like six of those, you know, at the same time. So basically, it become a you know shotgun, you know, but only using rubber bands. Uh, I once shot a fly, and uh, there were there was nothing to find on the day, and then over a period of months, I found you know legs, wings, a piece of an eye, and stuff like that. Yep. It's very humane. I don't think the fly you know, felt anything at all. So anyway. <coughs> but the, um, OK, so let's go back to the homework assignment. Uh, for the homework assignment, you know, it is just mapping. It's just implementation of the functions. So I can give you the shell and not really go over the actual solution. The solution is really just yeah, programming in the equations into the code. So I can give you the shell of the code, which I kind of did last time. So I'm moving everything above an actual, not imaginary line. I put a tape on the screen right here because I know that people in the back, you know, have difficulty <coughs> seeing anything below that line. Is that about right? Okay. Cool. All right. So the shell of the programs is kind of like this, okay? One end to end dot CPP is the program that takes in one single number and spills out your two numbers. Yes? My microphone. Okay, let's turn it on. Without the microphone, it will still, it will still be recorded, you know, because I used this microphone for years before they had the, uh, the PA. Okay. <laughs> Somebody crank it all the way up. So C C C C C C. Okay, that's about right. Yeah, I'm gonna lower it just a little bit. There we go. Okay. All right. So for this particular program, um, let me turn off syntax first because otherwise the syntax highlighting actually makes it harder to read. So you just need to pound include IO stream so that you know um, C in and C out will be defined. And for those of you who want to use namespace, you can use namespace std. Um, for those of you who don't want to do that, you don't have to do it. So okay. the, yep, go ahead. Uh, why would you like not use the namespace std? 
Because philosophically, I think it defeats the whole purpose of having a namespace to begin with. Okay, so if you think about why we have namespaces, why do we have namespaces? That was not in the original C++. So why do we have namespaces in C++? Sorry? Convenience. To prevent conflicts. To avoid conflicts, okay? Which basically means you know, with a namespace, then another namespace can also define CE and CL for other purposes, right? <clears throat> so the idea of using, you know, the, the using namespace is kind of defeating the whole purpose because now you know you're telling the compiler and say, oh by the way, if you cannot find C in, go ahead and check out these namespaces and see if C in is one of in one of these namespaces. So if you include or if you use two namespaces that potential that potentially have conflicts, what happens? Well, the compiler cannot figure out which one to use, right? So it might give you a warning, an error message, or something along that line. So I think you know using namespace, you know that whole idea is for you know programmers too, so that they don't have to type std colon colon all the time. But and at the same time, I think it kind of defeats the whole purpose of you know, the whole concept of having namespace to begin with. So that's just you know kind of like a personal thing. Um, I'm pretty sure most other professors do not you know share my view. So is that an answer? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in this case, you know, I'm just gonna, this is one end to end which reads a single number and then spews out two different numbers. So I'm not gonna do the homework assignment, uh, but I can show you exactly how you can do it. Uh, you can use unsigned int because we're dealing with natural numbers, so unsigned int <coughs> is already enough. And then the way you do this is you say uh, while x re read into cn std colon colon in, and then you read from the standard input file into the variable x and you keep doing this as long as <clears throat> it is not false because you know what happens is the greater than greater than operator actually returns c in itself as the result of the operation but in the context of inside the parentheses of a while the compiler is expecting something that is boolean an input stream is not a boolean. What the compiler is going to do is to say, okay, do we know how to cast this? As, as, as it turns out, the C++ library does define, you know, there's a cast operator to cast from IOS into a boolean type. And that particular cast operator is going to report a true when there's no problem and return, return a false when there's quote unquote some problem. N of five is considered a problem and therefore, um, when we get to end a file, then the attempt to read an integer from C in into X will return false because we can no longer read any further than that. And that will also get us out of this loop. Is, is that part okay with just this control structure? Okay. <clears throat> so when we get into here, okay, I'm just going to put comments here. We are already quite sure that X has a value that we read from the file. So we can say X is a natural number read from stdin or in your case it'll cn so now we can process that now i'm not going to actually do the processing here but you will end up with two numbers okay so you will basically say c uh, standard out c out and then what you want to do is to output those two numbers so i'm, I'm just going to pretend these are the actual values that you're, you're outputting Obviously, they're not, okay? And then at the end, you also want to include ENDL for end of line, and that's it. So what you need to do is to replace x divided by two with, the, with one of the inverse functions, and then replace x plus two with the other inverse function. One applies to the first element of the two tuple, and then the second one applies to the second one. So that's one and two and two and one and is kind of the same, except it's a little bit easier because you're only using one single function to output. Is that okay? I mean, and you know, just to make the compiler happy, because the compiler is going to complain about not having a return value, so you just put a return zero at the end, and you're done. So is that answering the question? Yeah, I was just not sure how to get a <coughs> constant input from the. Um, like C in, but I guess it was just a while statement, which makes sense. Yeah.
Yeah, it's just a wild statement. And um, there were some discussions. You know, somebody mentioned that I was using the, the, the term files and text file when it comes to C in and C out, and there, were, there was some confusion about that. Um, I always look at C in and C out as standard input file and standard output file. In other words, they are actually files. Um, it doesn't really match the conventional notion of a file because it doesn't have a file name. It is not stored on disk and stuff like that. But it is really a file because you are using iStream to read or ifstream to read it in and using ofstream to write to a file. And guess what the F stands for in ifstream and ofstream? It's a file stream. Okay? So that's why you know, they are actually files. It depends on how your professor in CISP 360 explained um, what is C in and what is C out. So how did that professor explain that to you? What is C in? Yep. So you have to utilize, well, I only define k of something because you know, it is common to both of the values in the two tuple. Right. So I don't have to spell it out you know, again and again. Okay, let, let me just kind of flip back to that note so that we can take a look at the inverse function. <coughs> See if this explains you know, what, uh, what you guys are asking about. Okay, so we, you're talking about this k, right? Uh, no, down here. So k itself is defined as a function, and right here. So i is basically the number that we are reading in from standing in. So you basically first compute your k of i, so that you have that one number. And then the output makes use of k of i. So um, on one side, you have k of i times, in parentheses, k of i plus 3. And then this whole thing divided by 2 and minus i. And remember, this i is the number that you read from standard input. And then on the other side, you have i minus, and then k of i times, in parentheses, k of i plus 1. And then the whole thing divided by 2. So you do have to implement your k of i in order to do this. Otherwise, it just gets a whole lot more messy. So your program is not Oh, no. no that, 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 it, I'm, I'm just illustrating the file handling part, but not so much the function part. Okay. Yeah, so you do need to use square root in this particular case. All right. And the, yep, go ahead. And then it was the like, floor <coughs> function for like, the end of the... Correct. So the floor function is not really needed because when you um, cast from a double, which is what square root is going to return. Yeah. So when you cast that into an, an integer or unsigned integer, okay. it is automatically uh, doing the truncation. So all the fractions are gone. Yeah. And as a result, you don't actually have to do the floor. I just turned everything else into a double and then used floor. But I guess that's a simpler solution. It may not be necessary, because if you have a square root, which is this part here, um, it will automatically cast the other side of the addition into whatever is more general. And I, if I remember correctly, doubles are considered more general than unsigned integers. Okay. So that's why it will automatically, t automatically cast everything. So the only remaining question is what is the return type of k? It should be an unsigned integer. And if it is an unsigned integer, the return statement will do the cast from a double into an unsigned int, which, which basically does the same thing as a floor. Yep. Uh, we were allowed to use cmath, right? <coughs> the square root. We are cmath. Yeah, cmath is what you need for the square root, right? I don't know whether you really need that pound include or not. It depends on the compiler. No. Yep. So you may or may not need that. Um, I can give it a try here. So I can say. Um, just print the unsigned and uh, the square root of x. Let's see, I'm, I just want to check whether it compiles or not without uh, pound include C math. So G plus plus dash C one and two and dot CPP. 
dash C you know, just means that I want to compile to the object file, but I don't want the executable. And it complains, you know, so you do need C math you know, in this case. So if you pound into the C math, that should take care of that. There we go. Okay, excellent. Any other questions? Other questions? Okay, all right. So let's move on and uh, talk about the current topic. <clears throat> on the other day, last week, last Thursday, we started to talk about propositional logic, and then at the end of last Thursday, uh, we were at the end of this proposi propositional calculus note, which talks about semantically entailment and also syntactic entailment. So we're going to go back to those two, because those two are important concepts, even though we are not going to yeah, there won't be any real questions regarding these concepts in your midterm because you know, we are, it's a useful concept to understand, but it is not something that can easily be tested. Okay. But I, what I felt is kind of important is understand to understand these type of notations. So we'll go ahead and this time we'll don't go really slow because it, I was kind of in a rush last Thursday at the end of the class. But this time we'll go slow, you know, we'll understand what these notations really mean and what I'm really expressing when I say, okay, this means semantic entailment, okay? All right, so we'll go ahead and do this in the abstract way. And, you know, sometimes the abstract way is not the easiest. It's not the easiest to come up with. It's not the easiest to understand. But there's one big plus when we use, you know, abstract, uh, ab abstract notation in mathematical stuff. What is it? Why, why is math abstract? What is not abstract? Physical stuff, yeah. I, I, I bring along two bananas and then you have three apples and it go, you know, <coughs> and then you go, another caveman goes like, <coughs> you know, that's, that's not abstract, okay? You know, that's really, you know, concrete. But why, why do people come up with the abstract concept so they understand, okay, they can write on, on a piece of paper, this symbol means two. Because it can be applied to different situations. Exactly, because abstraction is the losing of the details, right? So, you know, the quantity two applies to bananas, applies to apples, applies to pineapples, right? Applies to, you know, all kinds of objects. So why, do, why are we stuck with apples versus, you know, pineapples versus, you know, bananas? So mathematical notation is exactly the same way, okay? So as we do deal with abstract notations, this is what we are doing. We are losing the detail that quote unquote does not matter, okay? How many of you are also planning to double major in math? One, two, three, okay? Okay, two and a half. <coughs> it's okay, we can do it with floating point numbers. <laughs> so if you're, if you're planning to major in mathematics, there is a one class, I kind of remember the course number, but in Davis, it's called abstract algebra. So if you think normal algebra is abstract, well, it's not quite that way. Okay, there's abstract algebra. So in the abstract algebra class, they talk about you know, zero and one, they talk about multiplication and addition, except zero does not mean zero, one does not mean one, addition doesn't mean addition, and multiplication does not mean multiplication. They are all abstract symbols. The only thing that you know is one is a, an identity with respect to multiplication, and zero is the identity of addition, and a few other things. But it doesn't really work with numbers. It is much more abstract and much more general than dealing with just numbers, okay? But the result of abstract algebra is now you end up with concepts that can be applied to a wider application of things, okay? Because you're no longer just dealing with in individual numbers. So that's why you know, abstract concepts are useful. So every time you think about, oh, why are we dealing with this, all this abstract stuff, you can just remember the, the conversation of the two cavemen as they try to bargain, make a deal. It's like two apples versus three bananas. 
Okay, so in this case, you know, we have these formulae, and if you remember, you know, um, these Greek symbols, in this case, it is phi. Um, they are called what? They're not variables, they're not constants, they are schemata. Okay, you know, that's just a name. They're schematas. So each one of these, phi 1 all the way up to phi n, and there are n of these, each one is basically a well formed formulae, a formula. And psi is a well-formed formula as well, but it is on the other side, it is not one of the phi's because these are the starting points. You basically already have proven using um, some other means that these are well-formed formulae that are known to be true already. So you know that part already. It is given to you that these particular well-formed formulae are true. So what you're trying to do is to say, well, can we also conclude then that psi is also true? Okay, that's what you're trying to do. So instead of you know, just you know talking about you know the you know this part here, we'll go through all of these definitions. So out of these n well well n plus one actually out of these n plus one well formed formulae, they only involve the use of m variables. The m variables are noted denoted here as p subscript. 1 all the way up to p subscript m. Is that okay? So you have n plus 1 well-formed formulae, and they use m variables out of all of them. Is that okay? Okay, all right. So what we do next is to define our domain, okay? So remember the discussion of functions. This is a function domain, and we use 0, 1, uh, the Cartesian product of 0, 1 up to m times as our domain. In other words, I'm just not writing this out as 0, 1 cross 0, 1 cross 0, 1. It is just, you know, this is the Cartesian product of 0, 1 or false true m times. Is, is that okay? Is this notation okay? So it's kind of like the power <laughs> of, you know, except, you know, it is the Cartesian product in this case, not your usual arithmetic product. Then what we do is we define a function f, okay? So this is actually a function. And this function is gonna map our domain D all the way to just false and true, okay? So this part here is telling you what are, um, telling you that f function f is mapping the domain D, in this case, in the, into the codomain of zero, one. So the set of zero, one, false and true, is our codomain. Is that okay? So this is all coming from the function notation. And the actual definition of f is if you give it m parameters, remember we have m variables, so it will take m parameters. That would define f. But what it really is, is just a conjunction of phi 1 all the way up to phi n. Is that okay? Does everybody understand why, you know, in the parentheses as parameters, we only have P1 to Pm, but on the other side, we have phi 1 all the way up to phi n? Because the phi's are representing, what again? Well-formed formulae, and then the P's are representing the variables used in those formulae. Okay, so those numbers do not have to be exactly the same. All right. <coughs> So just like this, we're going to define another function called g. It has exactly the same domain and exactly the same codomain, but the definition is simpler. The definition of g is really just psi. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So now we have function g, we have function uh, f. Both of those are mapping you know, from the domain d, which is the n degree of Cartesian product of false true into just false and true. The definition is, you know, F is the conjunction of all the phi, uh, all the phi formulae, and then G is just, you know, psi all by itself. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So here is the actual meaning of semantically entails. So basically, you know, we use this symbol here, okay? We basically say that the set of well-formed formulae, uh, phi 1 up to phi n, 
symmetrically and tails, which is the symbol that looks like a T with, a, with two bars rotated um, 90 degrees side, basically means the following is true. What does it mean? It means if you take any element out of D, okay, and you know I'm binding um, the element itself out of D, so that we use Q in this case to basically say, you know, we pick some value from the first um, 0, 1, we pick something from the second one, and then we pick something for the M1. So this itself is an element of our domain. Pick any element of the domain. We need this part to be true. So when you apply F to those Q values, it has to imply the G function. Now, this is really important because implication says if F is a zero, then the implication is going to be true anyway. If F is returning a one, then G has to return a one in that case. Okay. So that's the meaning of semantically entail. With en entailment, it's basically just saying, you know, when you have these um, well-formed formulae, it has to imply this for all possible combinations of the values in the variables involved. Yep. Well, you said that C1, 2, and L is true because they are local formulas. Say that one more time. You said C1, 2, and they are true. Is that correct? No, I said, you know, the function G or the result of applying function G has to imply the result of a function. Function F has to imply function G. The result of applying function F has to imply the result of function G. Okay, let's, let's work out an example. Okay, so let's go ahead and work out an example here. Uh, we can pick something that's relatively simple. So let me see what is the best way to do it. And I think I can just you know, type it out here because most of this stuff doesn't really involve um, well, except for the Greek letters. Mm, I'm thinking. Yep. Uh, does the zero, uh, does it, is it always zero and one? Or is that just an example? Say that one more time. For the domain and uh -huh. the function, uh, the, the elements are zero and one. Right. Can it be for any element? It doesn't have to be zero and one, right? It's zero because, because it's zero one because the variables in a propositional logic system are booleans. Oh. So they can only be a zero or one. They can they they are, they are variables, but there are only two constants involved. The one is zero, which is false. The other one is one, which is true. Yeah. So that's why it is you know limited to that. Okay. So I think I I, I think I've decided how to do this. Okay. So this is how we're gonna do it. Hmm? You can use pen and paper. I can use the doc document camera, but this will work out even better because I have to draw a table. So this is going to work out better. And you know, I can also share the file with all of you at, at the same time. So I'm going to go to the shared folder, which you guys all have access to. And we'll just create a spreadsheet. And we'll call this semantic entailment. So try to connect. Name it to semantic and tail. There we go. All right. So we have to use an example. Okay. So I'm going to use this particular one as an example. Um, I can I can always use insert. Oh, my screen is not big enough for this. So I'm going to have to draw it down a little bit just so that I can get I can get to um, this. Always, there's one called insert symbols. I can't see that. Nope. You see the uh, insert symbol. There's drawing on the bottom. Yeah, I don't need drawing. I need the symbols. And I thought there's one to insert Function. symbols. No, not not functions. Well, it's okay. I I can just you know type out you know five. Okay, so I can say you know, phi one is the following. Okay, so we'll go ahead and express what is phi one, and I'm going to use oh I don't know 
suppose we can spell out everything. So we'll go ahead and say, you know, P implies Q. Okay, so this is our phi one. And phi two is just P by itself. Okay. <clears throat> and then we want to use the you know, psi as this. So how do you spell psi? Hmm? PSI, okay. Because I, in my mind, you know, I'm spelling it as P S Y, because that's psychology. For those of you who watch uh, Babylon Five, you know, that's also why the Psi Corp uses the uh, Psi symbol as their logo. And then there's also the Korean guy, you know, Psi. <laughs> <clears throat> yep. Okay, so now we have, you know, phi 1, phi 2, and psi. Okay, so now we want to see you know, what we're dealing with here. Um, can someone tell me what is, well, so this, this one is kind of obvious. What is m? In other words, um, what is the number of variables involved here? Which ones are the variables? The Greek letters, like phi and psi, or the other ones, you know, p and q? P and Q are variables, and we only got two of those, okay? So we have, we have M equals to 2 here, and we have N equals to 2 as well because we have phi 1 and phi 2. That's the number of well-formed formulae that we are given with already. <clears throat> All right. So now what we want to do is to define, you know, um, the domain. So the domain is basically, you know, 0, 1 as a set, Cartesian product with 0, 1, as a set. The reason why I'm doing this has to do with the number of variables, which is m. Okay, so even though n is the same, you know, but this is uh, 0, 1 times 0, 1 because of m. Okay, so how do I define f in this case? So we say f of you know, the two you know, variables, we can just call it x, y, doesn't really matter. So f of x, y is basically the conjunction of the two phi's. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with that. So we say you know, it is just your know, phi one and phi two. But we already know what is phi one, okay? Phi one is P implies Q, and then phi two is just P by itself. But I'm using X and Y over here, so maybe it's help more helpful to change these to also match, you know, just use, uh, use P and Q as well here. So now we have P implies Q because that is what phi one is. And which is, and then the second one is phi two. Phi two is just p all by itself, just like that. So this is how we define the function p. Are there any questions about how we define function p? It's just a conjunction of all the phi well-formed formulae. And then g also takes on the same two variables. Okay, even though one is not used, it's okay. It's not a problem. Because it really is just defined to be psi. In this case, psi is a well-formed formula only involving the variable q. It's no problem. Just define it that way. So we still do okay so far with this. Okay. So what we want to do, okay, you know, when we say that you know, um, psi phi one phi two semantically entails you know psi, what it really is trying to say is if I use a truth table, okay, so I use a truth table. I have P as an independent variable, Q as an independent variable. We only got two of those. And then what we want to do is to, is to figure out, okay, for each row, which I'll define later on, what is the value of P, uh, FPQ, which is the function F, and then what is the function G going to return with the same two arguments. So we'll go ahead and figure out this part first. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And then we got one, one over here. So these four rows is exhaustively giving you all the possible combinations of values in P and the values in Q because each one is an independent variable. So now we've got all the all four possible combinations. Is that part okay? Okay. So now we have to apply P and Q into the functions. Okay. So F is defined to be P implies Q and P. So if both are false, what do we get? The implication is going to be true, but since we have a conjunction with P and P is false, so this entire thing is going to be false. Okay? And then with this one, you know, it's the same story because P implies Q is going to be true, 
but p itself is false, so it's also going to be a zero. Um, this one is going to be false because the implication itself is false to begin with, because you know p is one, q is zero. True implies false is false. So that means you know this part is already false. We don't even have to bother to look at the right hand side of the conjunction. This is the only one that has you know, a true. And then we have G here. G is easy because by definition G is psi, and psi in this case is really just Q. So we just copy the you know, column E over here. We get zero, one, zero, one. And the mosquito is landing a bit. Ah, oh, it. Okay, I just it just took off. Okay, put my rubber band here. All right, so this is the most important part. The most important part is to answer this question. Is FPQ, or function F applied to PQ, does it imply GPQ? That is what we want to, uh, that's, that's the ultimate test to see whether um, the side, the phi's, semantically entail psi itself. Okay, so let's go through each row and figure out. Zero implies zero is true. Because anything, because if the implication starts with a false, the implication itself is true. So that means, you know, we automatically have three ones over here because F, P, Q are zeros in all of those cases. So this is the only one that is kind of like, okay, but what about this one? Well, true implies true is true. So now that we have all truths over here, that means no matter how I parameterize um, phi one and phi two, they always imply psi. But because of that, now we can say that phi one, phi two as a set semantically entails psi, which is the result of the implication. Is that okay? All right, yep, go ahead. So is does psi always imply the implication between the two functions, G and F? No, it's not always. If, if it does not, if it is not implied, if, if column H has one of the rows so being a zero, then it is not semantically entailed. So it has to be an element. That means it has to be the Yes. Okay. You, you basically have to test, you know, because column H is the most important column. You need this implication to be true for all the rows. If there's one single row where you have a zero for the implication itself, then semantic entailment does not occur. It, 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 it's, it's not true anymore. Semantic entailment is basically, in short, it's basically saying, um, is this a result of that? Is psi the, the result of the set of the phi's? but using the meaning of the operators. So this has nothing to do with you know, using the um, inference rules. This is really just using the normal definition of what is and, what is or, what is not, and so on. Okay. Is that okay? Is that explaining the terms a little bit better? Okay, all right. So we can now switch back. And by the way, you have access to this document already. I think it is shared at the beginning of this class. So if you go all the way to the beginning of the class site, there is this, um, ooh, maybe I don't have it. I don't have it listed here. It may be in one of the other notes. Okay. It's not here, I'm gonna, I'll just go ahead and include it. So we'll go ahead and add this as a resource. Do you guys see, do you guys see the share drive, you know, a link to that anywhere on the, on the site? No, okay. I'll just go ahead and put it there. Um, this is a URL. And, and I wanna share the folder itself. Here's the link, and we'll put the link down here. There we go. <clears throat> Let's 
say when we turn the course. So now you have an extra item at the very top of Moodle. If you click that, that should bring you to the Google Drive. And the documents, one of the documents is the one that I just worked on. Is that okay? Okay. Cool. All right. So getting back to um, propositional calculus. So I'm going to fast forward all the way to the end. So now we have what is semantic entailment. Syntactic entailment is easy because syntactic entailment simply means that there is a way so that we can infer psi from the set of phi 1 up to phi n. So you have to go through you know, some numbers of inferences, but eventually you can get to psi from the phi 1 up to phi n. Is that OK? Um, so using the engines that we already have, we can probably do about the same thing. So using, OK, so let's go back to the inference rules that we have already talked about. So these are the inference rules that we have already talked about. So you can basically try to come up with the same thing, see if we can get to, if you have P implies Q as one thing, okay, and then you have P all by itself, and this is the set of the um, one whole formula to begin with. So the question is, can we derive it eventually to get to Q? And I think one of these rules is exactly that. Okay, so let me point out which one we are talking about. And I think that one has to do with this one here. Yep, there we go. So when you look at this particular one, it is exactly what we need. Because you know what uh, the highlighted uh, inference is saying is if you have you know, a particular law form formulae that is phi in that representation, so in this case, the P is phi, okay? And then the, the other side is just basically whatever this level formula is implies you know, something else, which is psi. So this is our phi, this is our psi. So you can see how you know, P implies Q and P matches that particular inference rule. Is that okay? So once you have a match of the inference rule, then you apply the inference rule. The inference rule said, you know, okay, whatever is the consequence of the implication is now the result of the inference. So we pull out whatever is the uh, psi component, which is Q. So that's why we end up with the Q over here. So the application of that particular inference rule combined with knowing P implies Q and P are already known to be the well-formed formulae in the system allows us to infer that Q is also going to be a well-formed formula inside the system. But this is syntactic, okay? So the main difference here is that is completely syntactic. It is pattern matching. I'm simply matching the fact that, that oh, okay, we have you know, a well-formed formula by itself, you know, it is P. Let's try this out as phi. Would it work out on the other side? Well, as it turns out, it works out because it'll P is also the, the first part of the implication. And so you know, we can match this rule. As a, and as a result, whatever is the consequence of this, in, of this implication can also be seen as psi. And then on the other side, the rule said you know, psi is the result of the inference. But since you know, psi in this case is just Q, now we can infer that Q is the result of the inference. But this is completely syntactic. In other words, I don't have to look at any truth table to do this. It's just really matching the pattern of the existing rules and say, can we apply this? If we can, if it can be applied, then we can end up with that particular result. Um, well formed formula. Okay. So, so the emphasis is one is syntactic and the other one is semantic. Now getting back to where we were, okay, scrolling down a little bit. <coughs> so now that we know what is syntactic entailment and what is semantic entailment, the notation is only off with only this symbol here. Okay, with syntactic entailment, it is the inference symbol. With semantic entailment, it is just kind of like that, except it has two bars instead of one. Okay. All right, so soundness, 
is basically asking, does it make sense? Is the syntactic operation making any sense? Okay, because you can have syntactic operations that do not make any sense. Okay, you can carry out the pattern matching and end up with some kind of result, but it's useless because it doesn't match any actual logic. So soundless is defined loosely like this. So what we are looking for is if this is true, okay, this what is this again? Is this syntactic entailment or is it semantic entailment? It is syntactic entailment, exactly. So this means you know, if we can apply just pattern matching and syntactic you know, transformation so that we can end up with psi using phi one up to phi n. If this is implying this, then for all possible transformations, then we can call the system sound. Okay, so remember what can make a uh, implication true and what can make an implication false. This implication here, this, if you look at this entire implication, if the first part here is false, we are not concerned. Because if the first part of the implication is false, the implication itself is true to begin with. So we're not concerned about, oh, what if you know, syntactically it is not entailing something? Then it is of no concern to us. So we're only concerned about, oh, what if syntactically we can actually perform this transformation? Then we really want to make sure that semantically it also makes sense. Anything that is syntactically derivable makes sense semantically. So that's soundness, okay? Does it make sense? Now, just because it makes sense doesn't mean that the system itself is really useful because it can be incomplete. So completeness is kind of the same thing, except it is opposite. So completeness is seen like this. You can see how close this implication is to the other one. We just flipped semantic entailment and syntactic entailment. We just changed one to the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So what does that mean? This means that if there is something that cannot be derived using the meaning of the operators, we are not concerned. Because we are only concerned when there is semantic entailment, which basically means it makes sense. Okay, we are using the Boolean operators, meaning we can actually result in psi coming from phi n up to phi n. Now, if it is semantically entailing, which means it makes sense, we also want to make sure that the system can derive it using syntactic operations. Is that okay? So what you, one thing you can probably remember is when you see this symbol, it means the computer can do it. This is syntactic operation, which is basically saying, okay, you know, if you can write a program using pattern matching and you can do it using that program, then it is it's working. And on the other hand, semantic entailment is what a person can do. Well, I'm making a math professor. Okay. Is that okay? This is saying, can we do it as people? This one is asking, can the computer do it using just you know, syntactic operations that doesn't really understand the meaning behind what is a conjunction, what is a disjunction, and so on. So when you have implication going in this direction, it means whatever the computer can do, we want to be able to do it by hand as well. That is soundness. Does it make sense? Is, the, is what the computer capable of doing making any sense? If this implication is not holding, that means there are things that the computer can derive. There are results that the computer says, hey, this is the result of applying those transformations. But we cannot do that by meaning, which means that transformation is meaningless. It's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't do anything useful for us. So going in this direction is syntactic, is soundness. Going in the opposite direction basically means if we can derive something, we also want the computer to be able to derive exactly the same thing, but only using syntactic operations. Because if this is not occurring, that means there are things that we can prove by hand that the propositional logic automated system cannot prove. 
And that's why, you know, if this is not going in this direction, going from the professor back to the computer, then it is incomplete because there are certain things that we can do for the computer system that is equivalent, supposed to be equivalent to what we can do, cannot do. Then it is incomplete. When you have both directions, then it is good because it is both sound, which means it makes sense, and complete, which also means that whatever we can do, the computer can do as well. So is, is that helping you understand you know, the underlying meanings of all of these things? Okay, very good. <clears throat> and this is really important when it comes to automated um, verification. In other words, the whole, one of the holy grails of software engineering is you want to be able to feed a program into a computer and then you want to feed the specifications of the program, which is you know, a mathematical, huge, long expression of what the program is supposed to do into the same system. And then this program, this super duper program, is going to come back with an answer and say, one of two things, true, which means, yes, this program does what it is supposed to, or false, it does not do what it is supposed to do. That would be the, that's one of the holy grails, because if we can have a system like this, then we can do valid, we can do automated verification. <coughs> Which basically means you don't have to feed any test cases into the system because it is mathematically proven that it works in all cases. Which is great. Okay, just imagine, you know, uh, as a software engineer, you don't need to test your programs anymore. You don't need to think of, oh, what should I use as test cases? All you do is to feed in the program in source code, you feed in the specification, which is what is supposed to be the final state when the program you know, is to quote unquote done, and then this program will automatically tell you whether it is the case or not. Now, it doesn't really help you debug it, it just comes back with an answer of false. It doesn't tell you why it is not working, so that part is still you know, up to the programmers to handle, the developers have to handle that part. But at least you know, as far as quality, co quality control is concerned, this software is not gonna leave the gate. Okay? Well, unless you're a particular gigantic software vendor, then they will just let it pass as well. Yep? How would you verify the software is doing that? How do you verify? You'd have to verify the software that does that first thing, right? Yes. So that would have to be done by hand, probably? <laughs> so that has been one of the holy grails of you know, software engineering. And you can look it up. You know, I think I talked about this a little bit at the beginning of this class. So when you look up software engineering uh, automated verification, okay, automated software engineering software ver verification and so on. So these are basically all the same terms. Okay, let me just pop up this one. Okay, software verification is a discipline of software engineering whose goal is to assure that software fully satisfies all the expected requirements. And the expected requirements are these conditions that we express in mathematical terms. Is that okay? So satisfaction means they're true, you know, and false means they're not satisfied. So experimentation is using test cases, and then uh, static verification is using analysis, which is proving the correctness of programs using just pure logic and mathematical derivations. And that's why we have you know, propositional logic, because we want to have a system where the computer can mechanically apply these transformations that we know as inferences, so that we can have the computer to prove theorems for us. That would, be, that would be great, right, in your calculus classes, you know, having the computer to prove theorems for you. You just feed in the program and then it will do it for you. And you can do it to a certain extent already. How many people have used a Wolfram, what is the name of that Wolfram software? Alpha. Alpha? Alpha? <coughs> yeah. yeah, so it can do a lot of proofs for you. Even show you the steps and whatnot, okay? But it cannot quite deal with programming just yet. All right, so this is good stuff. 
Um, this particular field, you know, uh, software verification was really hot back in the 80s. Um, you know, people were really energetic and there are lots of companies putting in a lot of money to try to get it done. Um, this is back in when AI was, artificial intelligence was still kind of a really hot field. And then in the 90s, people started to realize that they don't have enough comput computation power to even prove a very simple program to be correct. So a lot of people just kind of left the field because you know, it's just not practical, you know, they cannot do it. And there's not a whole lot of energy behind it because people are not really interested other than doing research to do uh, software verification. But now, you know, in the late you know, 2010s, people are getting interested in this field one more time, once again. Why do you think that is the case? What, has, what, what changed from the mid, early 90s to today? Computing power. Hmm? Computing power? Computer power has changed significantly, so that is definitely one of the factors, okay? Because when you look at Moore's Law, okay, you guys know about Moore's Law, so let's say we're talking about 1980, and we're talking about, okay, let's just you know, put it maybe two, three, three years down the road, we're talking about 2020. So we have 40 years in between, and in 40 years, you divide it by 1.5, that will give you the number of 18 months periods, okay? So we just do this division, what does it look like to you? Um, hmm? <laughs> 13.333, okay, so we'll both call it 13, okay? So there are 13 18 months periods within 40 years. Is that 26. 26. 26, 26. 26. No, yeah, not 13, 26, okay. 26. That doesn't seem to match 26, okay. So there are 26 cycles. What kind of cycles are we talking about? Why am I so obsessed with 1.5 years or 18 months? Moore's Law, exactly, okay. And what does Moore's Law say? Doubling. What is doubling? Okay, so that's the one thing that a lot of people don't understand is what is actually doubling in Moore's Law. What is doubling? Transistor density. Exactly. density of transistors, okay? But approximately you can call that performance of computers, okay? So it's not exactly, but we can call that pretty close. So that means if you compare a computer from 1980, okay, for the same money, you can now buy a computer that has two to the power 26 fold of the computation power of that computer. That is a lot of zeros, okay? So if you translate this number, the six, two to the power of six, we can handle it by itself, which is a 64, and then each two to the power of 10 is about 1,000. So we are talking about this factor, approximately this factor, when it comes to the ratio of computation power of a computer back in 1980 versus a computer in 2020 for the same amount of money. This is crazy, right? This is crazy stuff. 64 million times. So what was considered totally undoable, impractical, cannot be done back in 1980 is now doable. Nobody back in 1980, not even science fiction writers, could imagine that today, 40 years later, that we would have cell phones with the computation power that we have on cell phones. Even five years ago, okay, if maybe the first you know, dual core cell phone can come out and people go like, wow, my cell phone has two cores, beat that. <laughs> and these days you can spend $150 and buy a octa-core cell phone, eight cores. That is crazy stuff, okay? It's just a couple of years, right? Okay, so this is one big factor. What is the second big factor? that drives software verification today. It becomes important again, people are willing to put in money, energy, and resources. Yep? The internet? The internet, exactly. So back in 1980, the internet already existed in the form of DARPANET, okay? What was the speed of that internet? A little slower than today, right? Okay. Uh, most people still use dial-up, you know, connection using 1,200 BPS motors, 1,200 bits per second. 
you can read faster than 1200 bits per second. Okay? So, what about hacking? Can people still do all the hacking that we, we can do today? Yes, in theory, but it'll be extremely slow. Okay? If you want to use a dictionary attack against a server like, you know, over a 1200 BPS modem, by the time you hack into the server, the content would have no relevancy anymore. Sure, you will break in eventually, but when you do break in, it's of no consequence anymore. Okay, if you're trying to get information to blackmail somebody, that person would have died centuries ago. <laughs> <clears throat> the information is outdated already. Okay, so these two factors combined, computation power and the connection of the internet drives software verification. Because the heart bleed bug or the you know, software vulnerability has to do with the lack of software verification. If they did have you know, software verification, only to apply that to the most important part of the libraries, they would not have that problem. Okay? So this is why you know, this is a field that is becoming important again, which also means you know, if you're going into a uh, four-year university and planning to go to graduate school, this may not be a bad idea as a long-term or long, um, how do you call those things? Long-term trajectory, because you know, this is something that people want to work on. Okay, and there are important reasons. It's not really doing research for the sake of doing research, because if we don't do this, okay, there are many other countries. What is the number of countries in on Earth? Let's call it X. Okay, so. How many countries do you think are trying to attack the computers in the United States? No. It's not X minus one, it is X. Because there are people in this country trying to attack our own computers for financial gain. <laughs> so if you think about it that way, doing this is one of the best way to defend computers. Because you can basically just prove that a piece of software works the way it is supposed to, as long as the requirements are carefully crafted to get to deal with the situations when somebody is trying to break into the system, if you can verify, if you can go through software verification and prove that your library works, no matter what is being fed into the system, then you have a solid piece of code that cannot be broken, and you don't even have to test it because it is mathematically proven. proven. So this is why you know this topic you know may become actually useful again I mean, because they put it into the syllabus because it has traditionally be something of interest to researchers but these days hey you know it may actually become useful again. All right, so we are done with the propositional calculus slide and we have about oh we got about twenty minutes left or fifteen ish, so we can now move on to normal forms. Okay. A normal form is basically just a particular way of writing a well-formed formula. Okay? And there are two major forms or two major normal forms. One is called conjunctive normal form and the other one is called disjunctive normal form. It is, it's basically just saying, okay, can we use a particular structure where the end is the last operation or can we use another structure where the or is the last operation of those expressions? Okay, so let's go ahead and, so we basically look at a conjunctive normal form in this class. There's a particular reason why we look at C and F or conjunctive normal form. The reason will be kind of clear when we get to resolution, but not before. A conjunctive normal form, well-formed formula, is one that is a conjunction of disjunctions. And each disjunction is a disjunction of either variables or negative variables. So each component of a disjunction can only have either variables or the negation of variables. <coughs> okay, so it is useful to look at this in a reverse way, which is basically to ask, what is a CNF? A variable by itself is automatically a CNF. Even though there's no conjunction or disjunction, it is by definition a quote unquote CNF. A negation of a single variable is also automatically a CNF. Is that okay? 
when you have a conjunction, or when you have a disjunction, a or, consisting of only either um, variables or the negative of a single variable, the disjunction itself is also by definition a c and f. Once again, there's no conjunction involved, but by definition it is. So when you look at p or q, it is a c and f. When you look at not p or not q, it is a c and f. When you look at not p or q, it is a c and f, and so on. Okay, p or q or r is a c and f. And this is by definition, okay, because the term c and f seems to supply that it has to be a conjunction. Well, there is one, but I just don't want to write it out because there's always you can always make it a conjunction and say and one. Okay. It's just that I don't, you know, it's, it's not useful in that case. But these are all CNFs. So when you have a conjunction of CNFs, that becomes a CNF too. So when you have CNF conjunction with CNF, that is automatically a CNF. So this is the most powerful part, because this is the, the part that can go quote unquote recursive, because now you can construct larger and larger and larger CNFs. Is that okay? Now, when you look at the structure of a CNF, what it looks like normally, okay, with a, with a typical one, is the last operation is a conjunction. And what you feed to the conjunction would be a whole bunch of you know, smaller disjunctions. When you look at each disjunction, then we only have individual variables or the negation of a variable. Okay, so this is a typical picture of a CNF, where the conjunction is the last or the top level operation. Is that okay? So what this means is, this is not a CNF, because it's not a conjunctive normal form, because the negation applies to a disjunction here. It is not applied to a single variable. Now, can it be turned into a CNF? Yes. Okay, but as it is right now, the negation of a disjunction is not in CNF. Is that okay? What about this? P implies Q. Is that in CNF? It doesn't even have conjunction or disjunction. There's an implication here. Obviously, it is not in CNF. But can it turn into a CNF? Yep, it can be turned into a CNF. Okay. So here's the big question. Can we take any well-formed formula and turn it into a CNF? Yeah. 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 The answer is yes. Okay. <coughs> so we have an exercise right here. Okay. So the exercise right here is, <clears throat> this is by the way, you know, the same thing as a double-sided arrow. So this is basically saying P is equivalent to Q and that whole thing is equivalent to R. So um, this actual explanation here, I just cannot show both at the same time. So the explanation is already on this side to explain how we go from one row to the next. Um, in this case, I'm just going to verbally explain that. P, e, P is equivalent to Q is you know, translated into this part here because it's P implies Q and Q implies A. which you know, And then we combine that with the definition of implication, we end up with this part. So when you go through this entire exercise, okay, I'm not going to spell out everything because it is kind of tedious. But in the end, what we do end up with is a CNF. This last row here is a CNF. Because when you look at the operation, it's kind of hard to select only the portion that I want. There we go. So when you look at this entire operation, the <coughs> conjunction is the very last operation. It's the top level. But what is our, what are we ending, right? That's, that's the question. Each thing that we are ending by itself is a disjunction. But inside each disjunction, we only have variables or the negation of variables. We don't have anything else within each uh, within the parentheses. And as a result, this is in CNF or conjunctive normal form. Are we doing okay so far with uh, what is a CNF? Yep. Uh, the question about that, the implication that you put on the board, mm -hmm. can we rewrite that as not P, not P, not P or Q? Or Q, right. Yes. 
that is an, and that's a CNF. So not P or Q is a CNF because it is a single disjunction and the ind individual parts are either variables or the negation of a variable. So this is a CNF already, but not that. But you said that it has to be a, an and operator. No, if you have a disjunction, if you have just a single disjunction where individual components are variables or negation of variables, that is also a CNF. Because if you really want to turn it into a quote unquote CNF, it's easy. Let me turn this into a CNF. Put parentheses around this thing, and say and one, right? Now you have your and. Then what about these guys? They don't even have an or. How can they turn into a CNF? Well, you can always or a zero, right? And then put this whole thing and it was <coughs> one. Okay? Now we have a conjunction. Does that make any sense? So you can always coerce the, um, the small expressions to use the same format as the most general you know, format. It's just that, you know, why do we bother to do this or a zero, right? And then end it with a one. It's just for the sake of you know, having the conjunction in the CNF. Is that okay? All right, so we have five minutes left. Yes, go ahead. So how come when you negate the expression, it's not the CNF? When you express, when you negate uh, this one here? Yeah. Because when you because the negation is not applied to the variables. Now you can turn it into a CNF. This one is really easy to turn into a CNF using De Morgan's law. So when you apply De Morgan's law, this is now you know negation applied to the individual parts, and then you turn the operation from a disjunction into a conjunction. So now it is in CNF. But this is not in CNF, even though it can turn into CNF, it is not yet. Okay, all right, we got five minutes left. So what I want to do with those five minutes is to, well, I'm not gonna go through the details, but this is basically saying you can turn any well-formed formula into a CNF. Okay, so those are the individual steps. And the connection between CNF and propositional logic is a really kind of odd one, okay? Because it seems like you know, we suddenly jumped from discussing um, propositional logic which is all about inferencing, uh, we have all the uh, entailment and, what, and whatnot, into something that seemingly has nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with what we just talked about in propositional logic. Well, as it turns out, they are closely related. One, with propositional logic system, you can use those productions, the inference of your production, productions, to infinitely generate something that is not useful at all. You're not getting any closer to the theorem that you're trying to prove, right? I demonstrated that you know when we talked about propositional logic, there are certain inference that can basically endlessly generate new well-formed formulae that are just useless, totally useless. Okay, so if you're programming a computer that can only apply one inference at a time, how is it going to choose which one to use? A depth first search is not going to work. Okay? Because you can keep using the useless inference and regenerate basically the, the, a longer and longer and longer well-formed formula that is not going to get you anywhere. Okay? So it becomes really difficult to deal with that. So what I want you guys to do is to read ahead of me and read about resolution. Resolution is by itself a inference rule. Okay? So this is the tie of CNF back to propositional logic. Because we have this kind of magical um, inference rule, which doesn't seem to be all that simple at all. In fact, you know, this, is, this is more difficult, this is more complex than any one of those other inference rules that we have seen so far. Okay? Because what you need okay, is you need to have um, phi or psi and not phi or rho. So we have three schemata involved in this case. And then the result of the inference is just phi or rho. Okay, so this seems like you know oh this is not useful at all. Okay, but it really is because using resolution with any type of CNF, you keep applying resolution. 
you will come to a conclusion. You will come to one of two conclusions within a finite number of steps. Those two conclusions are either, yes, the theorem is proven, or two, the theorem cannot be proven. It cannot go indefinitely. Okay, so this is one of the really, really good outcomes out of resolution. Okay, but why does resolution work? Because remember, this is basically saying what kind of entailment again? Syntactic or semantic? This is syntactic entailment, which means we are just doing pattern matching and doing all kinds of string copy and whatnot, okay? But does it really make sense? Well, let's check out this part here. If this implication is holding, that means we have semantic entailment, which basically means the transformation actually makes sense, okay? So this whole thing here is basically a proof it is basically proven that implication is always true. Now, if the implication is always true, it means we now have semantic entailment. Okay? Now, this is really big. This is really gigantic. I know we are running out of time. We got two minutes left. But this is really big because now we replace all of the other inference rules. Forget about everything that you learned in the previous one. All those inference rules, we only need one which is resolution, okay? So we use a single rule of resolution to replace all of those inference rules. But because of the special property of resolution, it will end, it will terminate eventually within a finite number of steps. So now, if you encode your logic system using CNF to begin with, using only resolution, you can now prove a theorem. You, can, you, will, you will always prove, end up either proving the theorem is the consequence of all the well-formed formulae in the iota, or you can prove that it cannot be proven. Okay, which is great, because either way, you have a termination of the algorithm. Now there's one more piece to this entire thing. The one last piece has to do with proof by contradiction. Okay, so proof by contradiction is over here, okay? So we will get to you know, the proof by contradiction itself. In other words, hopefully on Thursday, after we talk about resolution, we will get to prove proof by contradiction. No, nobody is getting the it. You, you guys do not seem to be abused. We're gonna prove proof by contradiction in fact makes sense itself. Okay, because there are three key pieces here. Okay, if you have to remember one thing when you read the notes ahead of me, remember these three major pieces. One, C and F is a major concept. Okay, it's just one way to represent the well-formed formulae, and all well-formed formulae can turn into C and F. Okay, which is great. Second one is resolution. Dump all of the other inference rules. Keep only one, which is resolution. Third piece is proof by contradiction. When we combine these three pieces, now we have a system to represent well-formed formulae where the engine of proving is very efficient. It always terminates within a fixed number of steps, and it always comes back with a definite answer of whether the theorem you're trying to prove is actually a theorem or it is not a theorem. It won't leave you hanging and go, eh, I don't know. I still need time to process. Check back you know, 100 years later. It always terminates. Okay, and the algorithm itself is really simple as well. So keep those three pieces you know, in your mind and read ahead of me as much as you can, and then we'll come back and talk about this on Thursday.